Salutations, friends. This is a little afternoon treat for you. I decided to do a Wendigo story, and like I said, it's an afternoon treat. There will be a dogman encounter later on in the evening or early morning. I also am including my PayPal account. I will not monetize my channel, but as other narrators have let people know, it does cost money to have our channel. So if you'd like to donate anything, whether it be a dollar to whatever, please check out my PayPal account and feel free. If not, I understand completely and I will still keep bringing you videos. Have a great day, guys. Enjoy the afternoon delight. Mostly because I grew up in northern Ontario and it's rare to see it mentioned on the internet at all, I was shocked to read a post by someone which detailed their experience as on a camping trip around the area I'm from. I had read the post simply out of curiosity, but some of the things written in it stood out to me. When I investigated the comments and found out the author was describing the exact area in which I grew up, I certainly hadn't expected that. Ontario's gigantic. What are the odds? My blood ran cold. First, I think I should provide some background. As I said above, northern Ontario constitutes a large area of Canada and even Ontario. Besides this, it's sparsely populated. The towns are small, few, and far between linked only by the Trans-Canadian Highway, and between them, long swath of dense, dark forests. Maybe a few trails for skiing, but largely uninhabited. I grew up near these forests, but didn't really venture into them too much until my dad bought a large property when I was about 10. The property was gigantic, about 500 acres, dirt cheap, and mostly forest or exposed rocks that so characterizes the Canadian shield landscape. Someone there had owned horses, so there were two very overgrown fields, grass up past your head, and a couple chicken coops. It even had some trails running through part of it, from a house to a large river where we could go swimming in, to an abandoned mine shaft and connecting to the backs of other properties. Despite the worries of bears, and I can't count how many bears I've come across there, I hike these trails nearly daily. I always loved the outdoors, and there was nothing I liked better than being alone in the middle of nowhere, not another human in sight. Of course, I brought my dog Rudy with me for safety. He was an expert bear chaser. Mostly these walks were uneventful. I would get to the river, take a swim, and head back home. The walk there and back took about two hours. The creepiest part was probably the last leg to the river. You would break out of the forest to some rolling plains, which were bare due to the large power lines up. You would take the trail along these hills parallel to the forest until you reached the water. There was a loud droning hum in the air the entire way due to the power lines. Besides that, complete silence except for my own voice. I always sang on the trails. It was a good way to warn bears away from you. The thing about bears is they don't want to fight you or even be near you. If you give them a good warning that you are approaching, they usually clear out. Some people play radios. I would sing. The first thing that I can remember happening was that I was walking along the hill path, singing like I always did, and the droning silence behind my voice was broken by a weird bleeding sound. Rudy took off running towards it immediately, so I followed him cautiously. I thought it might be a deer or something. So I was intrigued. For how large the property was, I never really saw a deer on it except once, which... I'm getting to, so I was curious. When I caught up to Rudy, he was cornering the path next to the woods, barking furiously. 
I hung back a couple yards because it immediately became apparent to me that this was not a deer. I couldn't see what it was, but I could see the bush thrashing wildly, the tree branches swinging low to the ground. Whatever it was, Rudy had frightened it back into the clover. But the size of the animal required to make that large of a racket had me suspecting a bear. It wasn't retreating, but it wasn't about to continue forward, so I turned around and headed home. The next day I was in the house, and it was near twilight. I had an unspoken rule. I never went outside after dark. You would be stupid, too. Everyone has stories about a relative attacked by coyotes after dark, or coming in between an aggressive bear and your garbage can, so I stayed inside. I was on my balcony, reading, when my brother pointed out something in the fields to me. The fact we could see this thing at the all was amazing. The grass in the field was high due to the years of neglect, but there it was, this massive buck. He was enormous, at least eight feet tall. We thought it might be a moose at first, but his face was far too delicate looking. And there was no mistaking those giant sharp antlers. He stood in the field, gazing at our house, not moving as the sky darkened. It must have left in the night. My brother was angry the next morning. He was woken up several times throughout the night as Rudy had been barking at something. He reported hearing an odd noise, but was mostly just mad at the dog. I didn't think anything much of it. We thought he had chased away the deer or something, inspecting of the chicken coops when we went to feed them before school revealed that some of our hens were missing, and we found the feathery remains of one of them a yard or so away from the coop, on the edge of the horse field. Maybe Rudy had been chasing away raccoons or foxes instead. I don't know when this happened, but it was some time after, on our way home from school, the bus dropped us off on the edge of the highway and we would have a long walk home down the driveway. We looked down the side of the path and saw something standing about 200 meters away. I went to see my brother last week and I brought it up with him because it had been on my mind since I read that post. I asked him if he remembered that time we were walking from the bus and we saw something. He said yes, laughed a bit, and I asked him to describe it. It was tall, white, on two feet, he said. See, I thought so too. I remember it being on four feet at first, and then standing up until it was on two. I remember it was white. It was white. It looked a bit like a deer, and we saw it, and it must have seen us because it just walked away into the woods on two feet. I don't know what it was, though. Did you ever see it again? No. I had, though. For a while, I kept hearing the weird bleeding noise at night, and our chickens kept disappearing. Then our ducks went, even though they were locked into a coop at night. Then the feral cat colony in the barn started being picked off a couple at a time. I dreamed about messed up animal once around that time. It was an animal that began as a crane flying low to the ground and morphed into a decaying centaur-like creature as it stumbled to the ground from flight. It shapeshifted, tumorous and bruised. It was screaming in that bleeding voice, almost like a human, but not quite. Sniffed the air blindly, charging at me. I woke up just as it touched me. I don't know what it was. Maybe I was just upset by the cats disappearing and our livestock going, and I had a nightmare about it. Maybe it was nothing. I'm not here to say any of this was something supernatural, just that it happened, and that it was weird. Eventually, we stopped hearing the bleeding noises at night. 
I stopped hiking. I moved away to go to school. When my boyfriend and I visited my dad at his property and I took him for a walk, he said the place gave him the heebie-jeebies. Why? This feels like prime Wendigo country. What the hell's a Wendigo? I'll tell you what a Wendigo is now that I know. Back in the day, if a community became cut off from food, they might resort to cannibalism in order to survive. But it caused madness. It was also called Wendigo sickness. Was it only a legend created to explain these people who would resort to eating family and friends? A Wendigo is a witch. Ojibwe's and many other indigenous people have a legend about Wendigo's. It is a witch. It was a person that desired power so badly that they paid a terrible price for the ability to shapeshift and immortality. They became mad with corruption. They were always hungry and feed on anything, but above all else, they were cannibals. They are so old and wretched that they look like zombies in their real form, graying skin, narcosis, bloated bellies from gorging themselves on any flesh they can find. Wendigos are pure greed and hunger. They can shapeshift. They can turn into a person, into an animal. A masterful Wendigo can imitate a human voice or a baby's crying to lure you over, get you lost in the woods, then they strike. They can infiltrate a group and pick you off one by one. They mostly hunt at night. You are Never supposed to whistle at night because it attracts bad spirits, Wendigos included. Northern Ontario is unceded indigenous land. Upon further investigation, I realized that my boyfriend was right. This was prime Wendigo country. I had been so preoccupied with singing to keep away bears that I had never thought about what I might be luring home with me.